Tonight's meeting, installment 21, starting with chapter 40. He ran far that day, away from the town, letting the wind wash him. When he returned to the West End, he heard in the distance Mrs. Pickwell whistling her children to dinner. Although he had heard that whistle many times, he had not answered it since his first day in town. And now he felt, as he had that day, that it was meant for him. This time, of course, there was a difference. He was no stranger. He was Maniac McGee, the kid who had walked barefoot through the dump near their house. The Pickwell kids cheered when he showed up and treated him like a legend in the flesh. Mrs. Pickwell did better. She treated him like a member of the family, as if she would have been surprised if he hadn't come on the whistle. Nor was Maniac the only visitor for dinner. Mr. Pickwell had brought home a down-and-out shoe salesman in sore need of sympathy and a good meal. As Maniac ate and talked and laughed his way through dinner, he couldn't help but thinking of the Beals, how alike these two families were. Friendly, giving, accepting. So easily he could picture the Beals' brown faces around this dinner table and the little Pickwell's kids' white bodies in the bathtub at 728 Sycamore. Whoever had made... <clears throat> Whoever had made of Hector Street a barrier, it was surely not these people. Fortified by his good times at the Pickwells, Maniac returned to the McNabs. After the East End scare, Russell and Piper no longer demanded stunts of him in return for attending school. On the one hand, this was a relief to Maniac, but on the other, it left him with less influence over them. He could always extort a day or two in, in class from them with a free weekly pizza. But beyond that, he goaded them towards school any way he could. He organized a marbles tournament that could take place only in the schoolyard during recess. He tried reading to them, as he had to Hester and Lester and, the Grace, and to Grayson, but they paid as much attention as the roaches. He took them to the library and then scrapped that idea after their shenanigans left the librarian blubbering and blue-faced. Then May arrived with its warm weather and it blew away what little power he had left. The boys began to dream of travel. Wood appeared in the backyard. They were building a raft. Gonna sail down the river to the ocean, they said. One day he heard frenzied honk, horn honking and screaming and he turned to see an accident. A rusty gas hog convertible rolled by with Russell behind the wheel and Piper jumping up and down and shrieking in the back seat. By the time Maniac caught up, they were gone and the car was shuddering against a telephone pole. Another time, he had to run them down and haul them back to Dorsey's grocery, where he made them empty their bulging pockets of the 50 bubblegums they had stolen. It was a maddening, chaotic time for Maniac. Running in the mornings and reading in the afternoons gave him just enough stability to endure the zany nights at the McNabs. When he asked himself why he didn't just drop it, drop them, the answer was never clear. It wasn't so much that he wanted to stay as much as he just couldn't go. In some vague way, to abandon the McNabb boys would be like abandoning something in himself. He couldn't shake the suspicion that deep inside Russell and Piper McNabb, in the prayer dark seed of their kidhoods, they were identical to Hester and Lester Beale. But they were spoiling rotting from the outside in, like a pair of peaches in the sun. Soon, unless he, unless somebody, did something, the rot would reach the pit. And yet he held back. Oh, he prodded and persuaded and inspired and bribed the boys to do right, but he never forced them, never commanded them, never shouted. Because to do so would be parental, and he was not yet ready for that. How could he act as a father to these boys when he himself ached to be somebody's son? But then one day the boys went too far. He found them playing with the old glove that Grayson had given him for Christmas. As if that weren't bad enough, they were using it as a football and punting it back and forth. Maniac exploded. He popped off for a good 10 minutes and got it all out. This was the last straw, he told them. From now on, it was going to be different. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. When I say jump, you say how high. Got it? And they got it. For the first time in their lives, the boys were speechless. Speechless as they did their homework that night. Speechless as they went to bed at nine o'clock. Speechless as they went off to school the next morning. The peace lasted three days. 
shock accounted for the first day, and the second and third days were a new game called obedience, or being good. When the game lost its appeal, Maniac lost his power. He told them to sit, and they stood. He told them to stand, and they sat. Instead of going to school, they worked on the raft, and instead of doing homework, they played war in the pillbox. They brought their plastic weapons down from the hole, and they stationed themselves at the two small gunnery slots in the cinder block wall, and they blasted away at anybody moving through the house, not to mention imaginary rebels streaming through the door and over the window sills. Stop! Maniac finally yelled, and he snatched the two red gun barrels that were protruding from the slots. In a moment, two more barrels appeared. Stop! he commanded. We ain't shooting you, Russell whined. We're shooting them rebels. Bam, bam, bam. Pow. Got one. Pow. Bam. Got another. Bam, bam. I said, stop. Maniac grabbed the guns, threw them on the floor, and stomped on them. He didn't stop until they were plastic splinters. The only sound was that of the turtle scratching somewhere in the room. The gunnery slots framed the boys' dumbstruck faces. Russell was the first to speak. Get out of my house. Yeah, sneered Piper. Out of here. Maniac went upstairs, got his satchel, and was gone. That night and the next night, he slept in the park. And the following day, as he sat reading in the library, in came the McNabb boys. They rushed to him. Hey, Maniac, blurted Piper. We've been looking for you. We got, you got to come to my birthday party. I'm having a party tomorrow. What do you say, huh? You coming, huh? Maniac couldn't believe it. The ugly feelings of the other day showed nowhere on their excited faces. Come on, Maniac, you gotta. And just like that, as he stared at them, an idea came. An idea as zany as they were. The words seemed to lift right off of their faces like sunburnt skin peeling. Well, okay, he said on one condition. What's that? If I can bring somebody with me. Sure, bring everybody. We're gonna party. The librarian edged closer to the phone. Chapter 41. The McNabb boys didn't know whom they did expect Maniac to bring to the party, but one thing was for sure. They did not expect him to come walking through the front door with a black kid. And though that was only the half of it, from the way that kid swaggered in and from the candy bar jutting out of, of his mouth like a chocolate stogie, from the ripped stone evil scowl on his face, this kid had to be none other than Mars Bar Thompson himself. If black meant bad, and if black meant in your face nastiness, and if black meant as far from white as you could get, then Mars Bar Thompson was the blackest of the black. Here, in the middle of their living room, stopping the party. The neighborhood kids, the Cobras, even George McNabb, stopping them dead as traffic. Just walked in through the front door, the steel door, breezed right on in, past the bars, just standing there. I own this joint standing there before they knew what was happening and before anybody could reach for anything, which of course is just what Maniac had had in mind remembering how little Grayson had known about black people and black homes, and thinking of the McNabb's wrong-headed notions, and thinking of Mars Bar's knee-jerk reaction to anyone wearing white skin, and thinking, well, naturally, what else would you expect? Whites never go inside blacks' home, much less inside their thoughts and feelings, and blacks are just as ignorant of whites. What white kid could hate black kids after spending five minutes in the Beals' home? And what black kid could hate white kids after answering Mrs. Pickwell's dinner whistle? But the East Enders stayed in the East End and the West Enders stayed in the West. And the less they knew about each other, the more they invented. It hadn't been easy finding Mars Bar and taking all his lip about cheating on the race and taking some bumps and some shoves. Mars goading him to fight. But keeping his own cool and matching Mars Bar's glare for glare and telling him he wasn't as bad as he thought he was, really getting him stoked up and making him slam his candy bar to the ground. No, you want to tell me why I ain't so bad, fish? Go ahead, for I waste you. He was chest to chest. Keeping cool and letting Mars Bar do all the huffing. It's simple, Maniac said. 
You don't cross Hector. You stay over here where it's safe. How bad would you have, would you be over there? Stepping back then and folding his arms, smugging it up just enough, and standing there in his white skin, gazing nonchalantly about six blocks deep into the heart of the black side of town. I guess that makes me badder than you. They didn't go straight to the McNabb's house. First, they went to the Pickwell's. Maniac wanted Mars Bar to see the best part of the West End. The little Pickwells made as much fuss over Mars Bar as they did over Maniac. They believed, as did all kids in the West End, that he carried a hundred Mars Bars with him at all times. Not surprisingly, Mrs. Pickwell never batted an eye when she saw who was coming to dinner. It was quite a sight, all right. Sixteen Pickwells plus Maniac plus a down-and-out golf caddy. Eighteen so-called white faces and then Mars Bar Thompson. To his credit, Mars Bar didn't use the word fish belly or honky even once, although on one occasion he did bend the truth a mite when a Pickwell kid asked him if it was true about the famous race in April. Did Maniac really beat him going backwards? Mars Bar studied his fork for a minute and said, yeah, he went backward, but you got the story wrong. It wasn't me, me he beat, it was my brother, Milky Way. The little kids couldn't understand why the grown-ups laughed for five whole minutes after that. As for Mars Bar himself, his expression never changed until the dinner was almost over when the littlest non-baby Pickwell named Dolly called him Mr. Bar. And even then it was so much a smile it wasn't so much a smile as it was a crack in his glare. Even if Mars wasn't letting on, Maniac could tell he was pleased to learn that his fame had spread to the West End. When they left, half the Pickwell kids followed them, begging Mars Bar to perform his legendary feat of stopping traffic. Don't, Maniac said. It might not work over here. But the Pickwells persisted, and when they reached Marshall Street, Mars Bar commanded, stay here. And then he stepped out into traffic. Not only did he shamble, jive, shuck, and hip doodle at his own sweet pace, he did something he had never even done in the East End. He came to a complete and utter halt halfway across and let nothing but the evil in his eyes take care of the rest. He stood like that for one full minute. And by the time he finally moved on to the far side, so the legend goes, 23 cars, several bicycles, and a bus were stacked to a dead stop in both directions. Maniac hurried across while the Pickwell stood at the curb, cheering and waving goodbye. But no one was cheering now in Fort McNabb. And Maniac knew that despite the swagger and the scowl and the chocolate stogie, Mars Bar Thompson was one uneasy dude.